So hi guys, welcome to my talk, Attackers in Open Source Supply Chain, The New Frontier. First of all, I'm very happy to be here. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Tzachi, Zach. Uh, I was the founder of a company called Dustico, uh, which was focused about detecting attackers in code packages. We started a couple of years back when software supply chain was just like a vague concept. Thank you, Putin, for SolarWinds. <laughs> This field became increasingly hot with a lot of people talking about that. And I would like to share some of the research and some of the trends that we are seeing attackers doing in this field. But first of all, I always like to, to talk about what's the problem and what I'm not doing in the problem. Because it seems that everybody's promising that they're doing everything at once. So let me just like quantify it. So first thing we, we all understand is that so supply chain uh, security is a process, right? It's not a single point that you need to fix and move on at it. It's the same in the automotive industry. The car manufacturer doesn't manufacture the wheels or the AC system, but he has a process in place to make sure that all the parts he's getting are at the right quality. So for, many, for a very long time, we try to define the problem. And I really want to thank for the guys who actually adopt the, the name of one of my favorite dishes, salsa. So basically salsa really helps me to talk about the problem in a defined way so I can talk about what I'm doing inside Salsa and what part I'm not actually dealing with right now. And I really like Salsa because of course, it's, uh, it's, it came from the Linux Foundation and now it's been backed like by every other major, st major body out there. So basically, of course, when we talk about the software supply chain, it's a process. We have the developer, he writes the code, stores in the source. Usually we have multiple developers and then we have the build process and the build process combines all of those codes together, together with open source dependency. And then we have a package or an application we can use internally or externally. So again, as I said before, there is no one problem we need to, to solve. There are many problems we need to solve. And it will take us a lot of time to solve all of those moving parts. But realizing that and looking at the, pub, the problem a couple of years back, I quickly realized that those parts Although there are a lot of different attacks, organization can do something today. Organization can decide how do they want to secure their developer workstation, or do they require their developer to use two-factor authentication when they're submitting their code into GitHub, where the build server is actually placed, what controls do they have in place protecting their artifactory. But the one point that we thought was one of the weakest link, and that's my talk for today, is gonna be around dependencies and open source packages. Because basically, there is not a lot we can do to protect ourselves. We can't define a standard that I now will require every open source contributor to stand to. So we thought that will be a weak point and basically <laughs> we were not that mistaken. And open source is critical because basically everybody uses open source, right? It's, it's essential for modern, uh, for modern uh, application. Most of our code comes from open source. Developer wants to use open source and to move fast. The problem is that they don't necessarily understand the full impact of what they're doing. For example, a developer would like to use a package. The package seems legit and well-maintained and popular. That's good enough. Not all developers realize that this package actually contains another package, what we call transitive package. And in many cases, this isn't a one-to-one -one ratio. It is something like this. For example, suppose I want to use a package called CNCGS. The package seems legit. The packages seem popular. But what I'm actually getting is this. So I don't know any developer who would go and vet any one, all of those packages and all of those contributors. So you can't just say I'm going to use like one open source package and that enough because everything is connected. It's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem like a jungle. And the jungle is growing because we are seeing more and more open source packaging being released every month. NPM alone have half a million packages released every month. So we automatically trust open source, although we have all this complexity. And we ask ourselves, why is that? Why we automatically trust everything that comes from open source and developer doesn't feel the need to check or to do some kind of check and balances. And basically it's because developer tell to themselves, Mm, I don't have time to do code review for open source packages I'm using, but if it's open, 
somebody will look at it. Somebody has spare time to look at every open source package that's been released out there. And if there's an issue, somebody will notice. And if it's popular, it must be okay. Like, remember, remind me of me as a small kid. Everybody's doing that. And it gives us a trustworthy feeling. As, as, as I can say, we feel safe using popular packages. And we are seeing attackers abusing those assumptions. I will give a couple of examples of taking those assumptions about open source and trying to use those assumptions against us. So a couple of examples. Guys, this is Faisal. Faisal is one of the good guys. He's an open source contributor. He maintains a package called UA Parser. UA Parser is well maintained. He's actually been fixing and adding features and, and actually working with the community for 10 years. And it's highly popular. Again, used by millions, including Facebook. So would you use it? And the answer would be yes, if it's popular and everybody's doing that. I'm going to automatically trust everything coming from UA Parser. And there's a good chance that even if you didn't say, I will use it, you're actually using it as part of another package that you're using, right? The jungle, as I discussed. And then we saw this. Last year, we saw on a Russian underground forum, somebody saying, guys, I've, I've actually stole the identity of an open source contributor, and I'm selling it to other criminals so they can make money out of it. And you can see he's actually asking for several different uh, uh, prices. So I don't know exactly how much this attacker got, but I can tell you somebody paid. And how can I know it? Because a couple of weeks later, we saw this. Face the rate online and say, guys, I'm really sorry. Somebody hijacked my account and published malicious versions of my package. It wasn't me. I'm, I'm totally sorry for that. I'm sorry to everyone who was affected. And that's exactly what happened. The attacker, and this isn't a vulnerability, the attacker did a technique we call account takeover, compromising a legit account and then using that account to poison the package. So everybody down the stream using that package would be impacted. And in this case, what the attacker did, he actually had a malicious, what we call a password stealer and a crypto miner. So I wish I could say this is a once in a lifetime event. It will never happen again. We can ignore this. But two weeks later, we saw a similar attack. This time around packages called Koa NRC. I have to say different contributors, right? And again, highly popular, well-maintained. And we saw the same malicious code being injected into both of those packages. So this isn't a vulnerability. This isn't a logical flow that we actually discovered. Those are actually attackers targeting open source contributors in an attempt to poison the open source ecosystem. And to be honest, we are seeing more and more attacks on good packages being happening in a very expedited pace since then. Just, I think, a week and a half ago, we saw this. We saw a targeted attack targeting PyPy contributors. So the attacker just wasn't like poisoning everybody. They were actually targeting Python contributors. And again, this could be Python on NPM. It doesn't really matter. It's an attack against the entire open source ecosystem. And they were trying to steal their identity. And guess what? They succeeded. And they actually published a couple of malicious packages that were removed later. Again, highly popular. So together with Sentinel-1, my team, because we really like to work together, actually investigated this group and, dis and discovered that they were actually active for a couple of years. So what we are seeing right now is actually like common cyber criminals realizing, wow, it's quite easy and fun to abuse the open source ecosystem to get more rich. And again, abusing the authentication is not a new thing. We talked about it with, um, uh, with UA Parser. And we are seeing us as a community responding and actually starting to demand two-factor authentication. So it'd be harder for the attacker to steal our identity. But like anything in cyber, it's always a game of cat and mouse, right? Now we are starting to, to add two-factor authentication. And it takes, it takes a while. You don't, you don't just like flip it overnight. While we are pre preparing and implement that, 
This is what I saw last week. We saw a, an attacker tools called Evil Proxy, which is built as a phishing as a service. And it just came out with a new feature. And that feature adds support to GitHub, NPM, PyPy, with automatic multi-factor authentication bypass. So we are moving one step forward, and, <laughs> and they are moving one step ahead. So again, um, this is like one, one of those examples, and it seems from the attacker point of view, now, now they realize the potential, it looks something like this. So it could be either a duck season or rabbit season, and like every week we are finding new and new attacks. It's like it's, it, the amount of attacks we covered in August was unprecedented. So we like open source, but as Uncle Ben said, with great power that give us open source come great responsibility. And we ask ourselves, whose responsibility? Is it Fed's responsibility? Is it NPM, PyPy, my developer, my CISO? Who's taking responsibility to stop those attackers? And by the way, this is an open question. I don't have all the answer. We are seeing what is happening and we are working together to try to fix the problem. So account takeover is just like one of the examples we saw this year. But we saw other types of attacks, for example, Guys, meet Brandon. So Brandon is an open source rock star. He actually maintains 41 open source projects, which is a lot. Really kudos to him. He's really spending a lot of time trying to make a positive impact. And he has one project called Node IPC. Again, when we look at the project, we look at popularity. Usually how many downloads, how well it's maintained. So in this case, million weekly download, well maintained, so most of us will probably do. Yeah, I would use this. I would use this project. And this year, we actually saw something interesting. This year, we actually Brandon add a new functionality to his code. So looking at the functionality, it seemed a bit cryptic, right? Let me demystify it for you. Basically, what Brandon added uh, is three functions to his code. First function is asking his code to reach us to this website, right? IP geolocation. And we can all understand what IP geolocation does, right? It's bringing you the location where the code is running. It could be US, Britain, Israel, Dubai, whatever. So why does Brandon care where his code is running? Exactly. Second thing he's doing, right? You want to say it? He's checking if his code is running in Russia or Belarus. And if so, now you don't need to be a developer to understand what comes next. <laughs> delete, delete, delete. So basically he turned this code into a wiper, into a bomb, right? And to add insult to injury, he actually added a small alt emoji after every file <laughs> he deleted. So a rhetoric question. What happened this year with Russia and Belarus that got Brandon so upset? And we know the answer, right? It's the conflict. And before I move to the next slide, is it the same attack I've shown you before of an attacker taking over a legitimate contributor account? This isn't the same case. This is a different attack because we can see Brandon in his own world. Guys, you download my software for free, so I'm allowed to wipe your computer. This is all public document license and open source. And he actually named it Protosphere. So by the way, I'm not sure he's mistaken with his claim, but I can tell you that I think, like, and I think that the majority of the community thinks that mixing politics with open source is a really bad idea. Nothing happened to him legally? Not that I am aware of, by the way. Uh, but I can, I, I'll talk about legal actions later, right? I, I'm not even sure that legally he did something wrong, right? Attackers are not being caught, by the way. And he actually documented everything. So again, he named it Protosphere, and the community really didn't like it. He said, guys, um, uh, Brandon, don't become what you hate. It's an abuse of power. And thank you for teaching me not to take codes from others. And I wouldn't like a Russian contributor doing the same thing. So I think it's a bad thing, but it is a thing. We've actually tracked five more Protosphere since then, and other acts of activism. So it's a risk we must consider that it's, it's a possibility that something like this will happen. And of course, I wouldn't use Node IPC, even if my computer aren't placed in Russia or Belarus. But what do I feel about these other 40 projects? 
Maybe I should lock the versions and look for a replacement because I don't know what Brandon would like to do in the future. So again, this raises a lot of questions. And we know that a good reputation is hard won and easily lost. And as I said, those are like a couple of those examples. But we are seeing other attack techniques being evolved this year. So we t see attackers evolving. So earlier this year, my group actually tracked a, 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 a group called Red Lily. So what was unique about Red Lily is that they published 1,500 malicious packages in one month, which is a lot. Usually we, we see an attack with 5, 15 malicious packages, but they really ramp up the scale. How are they able to do so much packages at, at one month? And that's basically easy. Automation. They invested the time and the effort to build the automation to automatically publish those malicious packages. And it wasn't just packages. They even created a user account per package. So you can't just like block one user account and that's it. So they were persistent in what they did. More than that, if you look at their code and try to block the, what we call C2, the command server, they actually changed the command center. So this is exactly what my group is doing. And for a very long time, we found them, we report on them, we go back, we found them again. And every time that we found them and report on them, they keep trying to improve their payloads, to hide their code, to detect if they are running on our system, to change everything but we still keep on finding them. At one point, they got a bit angry with us. As you can see in the, name, in the package name, they started publishing, but we don't mind getting recognition even from attackers. And to help the community to understand that there is a problem here, we actually released a tracker site called redlily.info. And in that site, you can see all the information on every package, when it was released, what it was trying to do, is this package still available or not? Because it can take a while once we report on something it's until it's being pulled down. There is, there is sometimes a delay. So we, we actually put it as a way to help to educate developers that, they, that there are bad guys out there trying to do those stuff. And basically, you can look, at, you can look here and you can see the relationship between a user and a package and a C2 and learn more. And as I said, this was unique, like a group putting up resource and doing like an automated attack. And it was unique for a month and a half <laughs> because then we saw another attacker doing automation. This time we named it cute boy because he actually used the word cute in the email aliases he was using. And he also built a different automation. He, and he was smarter by the way, because when he wanted to create a multiple accounts, he actually used the commercial service called MailTM which actually helped them create all those accounts per user. And again, we found that, we report on that, we report on thousands of packages, and we create a tracker site. So <laughs> it seems like trying to stop the tide, right? So we actually stopped publishing for four days after all the hard work that we did. And after four days, he actually continued publishing new malicious packages but he noticed us and he modified the way that the malicious packages were written. How do we know? Because he basically referenced the malicious packages to our research. <laughs> Still continuing, but giving us credit for the work that we did. <laughs> so basically I encourage you to go to Red Lily and Cute Boy and other uh, uh, sites Again, we are still uh, reporting everything, but it's a good way to raise awareness, to tell people there are attackers in open source. And we are talking about advanced persistent attackers that are always improving, always trying more and more. And I want to give you like one final example. So uh, <laughs> it's been busy in the last couple of months. Uh, for us, all those, uh, 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 the team has been really, really busy, working really hard, so something good comes out of it. We get, became really good at detecting the words. And as I said before, a uh, good reputation is hard one. Let me show you. So I'm gonna talk about the attacker point of view. So I have two packages here. One is called Pumpy, one is called Pumpy.io. This is an attack called Type of Squatting meaning the attacker register a similar package name in the hopes that maybe a developer will misspell 
or wouldn't notice is using the malicious package. So I know what you're thinking. If I'm a developer and I download the wrong package, wouldn't I notice that? And the answer is sadly no, because the attacker gave both packages or is malicious package the same code, but, and there's always a but. Now I can tell you that PumpIO was the malicious package and it contained another bit of code. When we look at the dependency, we can see this code. Can you understand what's happening on the first line? Can somebody figure out what he's trying to do? Thank you very much. Come back later for a t-shirt. I forgot to go into them. So basically he's trying to evade our scanner by reversing the URL and sending the developer SSH keys and other sensitive information to that website. Okay, so we understand what the attacker is trying to do. We understand this technique. Going back, we always tell our developer to check the reputation, right? So now we know that Pumpio is malicious. What's wrong with this package, with this image? Both Pumpy and both Pumpio seems to share the same reputation, right? If my developer will look at the reputation, it's not easily to, uh, to understand that it's actually downloading the wrong package. Any ideas how the attacker was able to, to get that reputation? Anybody? Exactly. In a minute. So, uh, t-shirt. <laughs> so basically, uh, is it really that easy? And usually when I'm talking to attackers, to hackers, they say, oh, he built a bot, a, 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 a lot of bots, and then he started collecting the stars, and he, he, he used another botnet to do that. He, he actually invested a lot of time to do that. And sadly, it's not that difficult. So what I'm actually showing you now is from the attacker point of view, how an attack looks like. So this is a package lab. Package Lab is our like metasploit for open source. It is where, where my research team is actually trying and experimenting all those attacks. So basically when you want to publish a malicious package, uh, basically what you need, you need an account. So there, of course there is no verification. All you need is just an email account and you can just register any email account. So that's not really a tough barrier. The other thing that you need is actually package metadata. So a package name, in this case, I'm gonna do supply chain demo. But again, if I was doing typo squatting, I would pick a popular name and just misspell it. So it's not that difficult. Again, as an attacker, now I need to change to, to pick a version. Guys, as an attacker, never use version one. Developers doesn't, doesn't want to use version one. So just pick a version. And now's the part, the interesting part. Now when I'm publishing the package into PyPy, NPM, I, I need to declare what project do I belong to, where my code came from. So as an attacker, I don't work for any project, but I'm just gonna go to GitHub, to the list of trending projects. In this case, I'm gonna choose a project called the Economist eBooks. I have no idea what's inside that project. I'll just declare this is my project, wait for it. What just happened? So basically there is no vetting. If we say we work with somebody, it will automatically get his reputation. So it's easier than you think in this case. Now the, now the stage that my researchers are writing all the malicious payloads, ransomware, dynamic uploaders, dynamic downloaders, all those stuff. Different lecture, maybe next year, because we have a lot of interesting stuff there. In this case, this is a dynamic uh, downloader. And that's basically it. All you need is an email account, a name, a URL, and you're free to go. By the way, we call this uh, um, activity of claiming that you are with a project that you have no similarity to, starjacking. Because basically you're, you're taking somebody's stars, right? And this is some of the traits that we are looking at. And that's basically it. We'll wait a couple of seconds. Voila. I just became a super developer in, in, in one single stroke. So for developer, it's really easy to understand that. So why is that that easy? Because the ecosystem, to be honest, was never built for security, right? 
So we are now trying to fix that and we are doing a lot of work, but there is no vetting of metadata in many cases of my website URL, my description, my name, the related Git repository as I've shown you. And it's difficult for developer to understand the truth. And actually attackers are abusing that all the time. So lack of vetting in typo squatting, for example. Is my name similar to another package? So this happened two weeks ago. When was DEF CON? Three weeks ago? When I was at DEF CON, we saw a typo squatting campaign uh, targeting Python packages. So basically they publish all of those packages. Again, you can see the similar name, right? with the legitimate packages and just look at the number of downloads, somebody would actually misspell that, right? It's a big numbers game. And we found this typo squatting attack really interesting because it actually did a lot of interesting stuff. For example, they use GitHub as their stager site. So I'm gonna check the website that my package is accessing, it accessing GitHub, who can actually block GitHub. And it did other things like uh, use legitimate service to profile the victim service, where he's running from, what is operating system, uh, adding root CA, and they actually add, add something that it was, I think, first we've seen in this field, which is called DGA. So again, this is uh, DGA's domain, domain generating algorithm, meaning if, if I'm gonna block this GitHub website, he actually add an algorithm there. If this GitHub URL is blocked, the algorithm will try to generate suggested other GitHub URLs the attacker is aware of. So we actually saw in the algorithm inside, so if we actually block the first GitHub URL, you would actually try to go to any one of those users who is still unregistered. So it's like trying, if you stop me here, I have other possibilities waiting in line. So this is like DGN, it's the first time that we've seen it. But again, he was using GitHub, right? So after we, as a C2 server, and we can see what's actually written in GitHub. So after we download the malware and reverse engineer it, we were able to understand what were the commands, the encoded commands, he actually registered on GitHub. And we saw this after a couple of days. Of course, we reported. It takes a while uh, to, go to get those sites down. In the meantime, we actually saw this. We actually saw um, this cryptic message, but we had the logic to reverse engineer it. And we actually was able to understand he's actually doing a DDoS against a Russian Counter-Strike server. So understanding that, it was obvious what we need to do, right? We actually challenged him for a, mess, for a match. <laughs> we actually opened an issue on his GitHub and I said, we are seeing what you're doing and let's, let's do a, like a match, <laughs> a Counter-Strike match. Whoever wins takes the botnet. So again, it's a lot of fun, a lot of uh, uh, funny things, and of course, it was removed. But we are moving forward. Actually, three hours ago, my researcher called me and, and told me, Zach, I don't see any new type of squatting attempts on NPM. And I said, okay, maybe the engine broke, maybe, maybe something fixed, because we always get a lot of similar packages we need to scrap and check. What happened in the last couple of days? So I don't know if, if somebody is here from NPM and it hasn't been announced yet, but kudos to NPM. In the last couple of days, they actually had the ability, if you try to register a similar package, like ddbug, they actually will stop you. So we are moving forward, starting to stop typo squatting, and we are doing great progress. Again, it's a cat and mouse. We will never fix everything at once, but we are moving forward. And this ecosystem, I said, was never built for security. So it can be things like account end off. So I'm, I'm an open source contributor, a maintainer. I don't have time to maintain the project. All an attacker needs to do is just ask for permission to build the new maintainer, right? And it actually happens. So that's like normal behavior. We can't fix everything. So sure, now you are the maintainer and actually Joseph, my co-founder or CTO, actually it's, it, it's, a, it's an expected behavior, right? You maintain a project called request, somebody asked for to be the new maintainer, I said, sure, why not? Take it. And again, all the reputation, all, that, all the things that we used to do, people don't understand the maintainer change or we added the new maintainer, right? We don't think about it. So I call this the trust paradox, meaning 
I hear CISO air all the day talking about zero trust, zero trust, zero trust. We don't trust our system, we don't trust our people, we don't trust our process. Everything needs to be, ex uh, to be examined. But if the code is coming from GitHub, no problem. So if I were able to, to break into one of your companies, as an example, sit on your developer workstation, write my own code inside your code base, that's a huge violation. If I publish it to GitHub, that's legit. Nobody's checking because it's open, right? So this is like w the trust paradox where, the, where hackers are try actually trying to get inside. And I've talked about dependency, but it's not just dependency, guys. There are a lot of moving parts across the software supply chain that we need to be aware of. So I've talked about dependency. Who's vetting? Who's looking at the code of the IDE plugins you're actually updating or downloading? Who's actually looking at the code of the GitHub apps he's actually using on a daily basis in every update? Or the package you already used in the past? Or the build plugins? So this is a huge attack surface and we need to, a lot, to take a lot of steps in the future to close the gaps, right? Because we started in a totally open system and now we are seeing that attackers are abusing that. And I'm saying attackers because I think one of the first things we need to do to address this is change the mindset. I think this is the most important part, that what we need to do. What do I mean? We've been working and dealing with vulnerable code for many years. And we need to improve that. But when I'm talking about malicious, it's not the same as vulnerable. It's a different problem. It will need a different attack set. For example, when we are talking about vulnerable code, we are always reactive. A vulnerability can sit in code for years until somebody will notice that and then we will fix that. I don't think it's the same thing that we want malicious code sitting for years in our code and still somebody will notice that. So if we can live with vulnerability being what we call a reactive approach for malicious, I think we need a more proactive approach. Go and hunt them, look for them take steps. We are really scared about managing vulnerabilities. It's not the same thing with malicious. You don't manage malicious. It's like a, a, a virus. When you find the virus, you remove that. You don't say, oh, the malicious package is not in a publicly facing website, so I'm just going to let it sit there. So it's a different mindset. We are talking about tools, techniques, procedures of attackers. And from that mindset, we, we need to understand that, first of all, we need to share information. Right now, we need the industry to start to understand that when I report on a malicious package, it is just being deleted. This is a bad behavior. Anybody coming from cyber, from digital forensics, don't delete the computer. Let me understand what the attacker was doing so I can better protect myself. So instead of just deleting that, we need to store that and share that to a central repository where other researchers and university can learn what the attackers are doing. Just like deleting that remembers, uh, reminds me like 20 years ago when I had a, a virus on my computer, the IT guy just formatted him. Problem solved. Now we understand we need digital forensics. There is an attacker. It wasn't a mistake. We need to understand what the attacker is doing so we can basically stop them. And one other thing. When I'm saying this is not a vulnerability, I really mean it. Pumpy and Pumpy.io, remember Pumpy.io? You know what happened when I reported on Pumpy.io, which had, I think, 70,000 downloads? It was deleted. Meaning all of those people who, who actually downloaded that in the past will never know. And why is that? Because we don't track malicious as vulnerable. So every company is starting to invest, to, to invent their own standard. I think it's a bad idea. We need a new standard for malicious. It's the same that we used to do for CVE. Because in many cases, a CVE will not be open. Like, sometimes it will, most time it won't. How do I know if a, if a package I actually downloaded a week ago and it's not available now, if it is malicious? Where can I query that? So again, we need to work together. This is not like one time you delete it, it will not go away. We need to tag it. We need to research that. We need to work together. So we, we are actually uh, working a lot with 
package managers. I said kudos to, to NPM. He did that today, a couple of weeks ago. They started vetting. Is your GitHub account your real GitHub? And that's great. I think we need to do that more. And if we're not doing that, and that's okay, at least say unverified. Because when you're displaying something to a developer and you're not saying unverified, is normal behavior from other places is been, oh, if, if, if they say that, somebody verify that. So I'm okay not verifying that, but just declaring what you're doing and what you're not doing. Because other, it actually, it, 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 it. help us report malware by API. Again, you can send an email when you find the malicious package. It works great when you find five malicious packages a month. We are finding thousands. You don't want to look at my mailbox, right? Um, so actually, I, I email exchange for every fine. I need to see what actually did. So we need to automate this process because the attackers are automating their process. And when we, as I said before, when you remove a malicious package, share the query from samples and the original metal data. We publish a lot. I'm saying it right now. If you will ever need something that it was deleted and it's unavailable, drop me an email. I'll be more than happy to share the deleted samples so you can actually learn what the attackers are doing and better protect yourself. Two weeks ago, I found, I think, a thousand malicious packages uh, on PyPy and NPM, but how did I find them? I found the malicious package doing a crypto mining on a uh, PyPy. I took the URL from the package. I searched the other packages that I'm actually searching. I found similar packages on, on NPM. So I reported on them. So attackers aren't just stopping at one package repository. So we need everybody to talk together, to understand we need to share information. So you take one lead and you actually start doing the threat hunting. So this is exactly what my team is doing. I have like two minutes, I think. So summary, uh, the basic question, and there's a lot of open issues, that is basically great power, great responsibility. Who's taking that responsibility? We can't assume shared model when and everybody's like pointing at the other guys. So I think if we're using open source, and again, everyone, the companies using open source, all the critical infrastructure, basically it's our software, our responsibility to make sure we got the funding, we got the process, we got the standard out there to protect that. Because this is, I think, the start of the trend and I think next year, <laughs> I'll have a completely different examples because we see b the barriers and, and we see where things are going. So then don't take code from strangers without verifying. And guys, thank you very much. So two things, I have like three minutes and lunch is coming. <laughs> so I'll be even downstairs if you want to speak uh, afterwards, but in the time that we have, go ahead. Um, yesterday the White House published um, regulations based on the Biden executive order. Uh, and basically it calls for self-attestation for the quality or safety. How does it fit with your uh, view specifically uh, uh, when it seems that uh, uh, you're doing the job of GitHub, PyPy, uh, NPM and others? I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm doing their job. Everybody has their own job. We need to work together. That's the first thing. And I think attestation is great, but I can tell you that being from cyber, we have a lot of signed malware. So even if we we'll ask people to sign, there is no problem to sign the type of squatting package, right? So I think it's a different attack vector that we also need to address. But from the attacker point of view, it's not it's not the main thing that we are seeing right now. People hijacking the packages while it's being transmitted from PyPy and changing it on the fly. We're just seeing them publishing it into PyPy. So I think it's highly critical that we uh, support projects like Sigstore and at the station and other great initiatives like NPM just took and start pub uh, uh, signing packages. But uh, in this example of attackers, I don't think it will sol slow them down too much, if that makes sense. Don't want to talk about it here. You can come to the booth. Basically, it's not a code scanner. It's a different technology. I came from the AV world. 
you can think of you as, a, as an EDR for malicious packages. Um, just doing code scanning isn't enough. I've shown you, you can do a stager. So the attack will happen in stages. So we had to invent a whole lot of different technology to support those use cases. So we are actually doing that, reporting everything to the community, sharing our findings, sharing our samples, but it's beyond just code scanning. Code scanning is just one engine of those engines. <laughs> we didn't think we will have so much, right? <laughs> so well, we, we were really ex excited about uh, Red Lily, and then we did Cute Boy. And I can tell you, we're working on a new website. Wait for next week. There's a, even a bigger attack that we just discovered. But basically, I have a GitHub with the samples. So I think the website is for awareness. And we really love awareness. We want to people to understand the problem. By the way, I actually, you remember me showing you Package Lab, the application? We want to allow developers to play with it. We actually, I actually imported Package Lab into a VR. Everything to get a developer interested in understanding the, the threats. So yeah, we didn't think we would do so much of, uh, uh, of those websites, but uh, um, that's the reality. Uh, my question was going to be, do you think it's worth uh, doing a website for? <laughs> I, I got the request, C combine all the websites. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'll probably do that uh, uh, forward again. It's, it's like a, a, a way to, to think about that. So guys, I really, uh, 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 I'm getting the, sig the red signal to stop. Uh, I'll be down, I'll be here, uh, uh, happy to talk to you. Hope you learned something new. Hope you find it uh, uh, inform uh, informative and um, see you next year.